Okay, I think we'll we'll get started and hopefully uh, a few more people might be joining us in the next minute or so. Um, I just wanted to welcome all of you. This is our, our first Gray Matters webinar uh, for this new series and navigating the financial journey with RBC. My name is Susan Oster. I'm a public education coordinator with the Alzheimer's Society Southwest Partners. I will be the MC and moderator for today's webinar. Dina Boone, uh, who's another public education coordinator with us, uh, will be uh, helping with our technical support today. At the Alzheimer's Society, our role is not only to provide programs and services to people who are going through the journey of dementia, but also to provide dementia education and to advocate for those living with cognitive disabilities. I do want to uh, thank RBC. Uh, today's presentation has been generously supported by them, uh, our RBC Wealth Management Dominion Securities, and uh, we have an amazing panel group from RBC here today. So before we begin, uh, a little business to go over relating to the webinar experience. So please note that your cameras are off and microphones are muted for the webinar. This event is being recorded and the recording will be available in the future on our website. The slides will not be available, but we will be sharing a few helpful resources along with the event recording. At the end of the presentation, we have approximately 15 minutes for a moderated Q&A. We will do our best to address as many questions as we can. During the presentation, if you think of any questions for the panelists, please add them to the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen, as you see here. If you would like to submit a question anonymously, please click the send anonymously box before clicking the send button. And please ask uh, any questions that were submitted to me before the webinar have been shared with the panelists. We have also enabled a special feature. It's called the upvote feature in Zoom which allows people to see all questions being asked and to move the most popular questions to the top of the list. If you see a similar question, so one that you're thinking about, posted by someone else, you can simply vote on the question by clicking the thumbs up icon underneath the question. Once the icon is clicked, the question will move up in the list. So those are the questions we'll be addressing first. And should you have any technical concerns, please type those in the chat box and Dina will be happy to help you. You may need to move your cursor around uh, to see the Zoom controls and icons. And you can submit comments in the chat box and they will only be seen by the panelists, which includes myself and Dina. Just a note, uh, since everyone's situation is unique, the information being provided in this presentation is for educational purposes only and not a financial advice for your situation. Should you have any specific questions about your situation, please contact your bank and or financial advisor for advice. And now I have the pleasure of welcoming our panelists, uh, Lauren Teven is a licensed financial planner with RBC in North London. She has more than 30 years of experience in the banking industry with past positions as branch manager and in human resources and has been in her current role at RBC for the last 14 years as an investment and retirement planner. Lauren was born and raised in London and attended Central Secondary School and Western University. She is an avid supporter of her community and currently volunteers with Home Team a charity for underprivileged youth in London. Jessica Thomas is a portfolio manager and financial planner with RBC Dominion Securities, where she provides valued investment and financial planning advice. Over the last 20 years, Jessica has developed her operational and analytical expertise, working in a senior management capacity across several different investment platforms. Jessica holds a BA in sociology from Western University and has completed her professional financial planning designation and achieved her charted, chartered Canadian investment management designation. And finally, Susan McDonald is a senior trust advisor with RBC Royal Trust and serves clients throughout Western Ontario. With more than 20 years of industry experience, 
She provides a wealth of knowledge related, relating to trusts and their administration. Susan works with individuals, families, and businesses to provide customized estate, trust, and incapacity solutions. And whether it is helping someone to settle an estate, establishing a trust to ensure the successful transfer of family assets, or arranging to assist with the administration and responsibilities for a power of attorney, Susan can help. And I must say that we have, goodness, uh, over what 70 years of experience here on this panel, which is amazing. I just did the quick math. So now I would like to um, hand it over to Jessica to kick us off. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen. So welcome and thank you. Um, I work in the London office of Dominion Securities. And I'm actually quite involved in the Alzheimer's um, Society on the board of directors this year. So I'm very happy to join um, everybody who has joined us. I'm starting with this slide um, because it really gives a good overview of our, our support networks as we're working through life and as we're aging. And today we're gonna be focusing on a very specific area, which is the financial side. Um, and that is banking, financial planning, investments, and trust services. So we've divided the presentation into three components. Lauren will be giving a really good overview of some of the everyday banking issues that clients will face and some tips and tricks on how to um, create a positive environment with your banker and as you're working through changing um, circumstances in life. I will then move back into talking a little bit more about financial planning and the importance of that as your situation changes. And finally, Susan will um, end the presentation with talking about what is trust services and powers of attorney. So I am going to um, oh, get my screen going. I am going to hand it over to Lauren now and she'll start talking with the everyday banking and financial safety. Thank you so much, Jessica and Susan as well. Thank you very much for including me on the Brain Matters webinar. Um, I'll jump right in um, in regards to um, some suggestions that we have seen uh, through the banking side of things that can help protect you and uh, your loved ones um, in regards to any sort of um, position they may have that uh, can help them in the future. Um, Essentially, with um, the everyday banking, it's really, really important to um, protect yourself. I know we're in a technical age now where we do a lot of things online and there's a lot of convenience there where you can go through your bank card and log in through the computer. However, I will say that in regards to managing and um, making sure that your plans are enacted the way you want, and also guaranteeing your protection, it's important to meet uh, with your uh, financial advocates at your bank. Um, in regards to the banking staff, I would start first off with a branch manager. Introduce yourself, ask before it's too late. Meet with the branch manager or your banking advisor or financial planner, and really this will establish any enhanced due diligence in regards to what you want for your banking situation. Um, in regards to protecting yourself, whether or not um, there is any signs of cognitive disability, dementia, or Alzheimer's, it really doesn't matter. This is in regards to everybody wanting to protect themselves. It's always a good idea with online banking um, to look at lowering the limits on your debit and credit cards. Nobody wants to have a huge amount of access. And also, it doesn't make sense to have a lot of money in a checking account. Always try and move some money aside into a savings account that's not accessible by a debit or credit card if you possibly can. I also think it's a good idea, too, to consider having all your banking in one financial institution. It's sort of a... Um, People used to think that they had to deal with different banks in order to get the best competitive advice so people would sort of sort of not keep all their eggs in one basket, so to speak. But nowadays, um, with enhancements um, to the banking um, to the Bank Act, you can actually have your banking all in one financial institution and still be very competitive, have great rates and still compare to other institutions. The benefit of consolidating to one financial institution is it allows you 
or the person caregiving for you to um, be able to see everything in one area. And it just adds to convenience. Um, again, that bodes to the next point, which is consolidating to your one main banking account. Keep the minimum in there that you need to pay bills, to do your day-to-day -day transactions, et cetera. But again, if there's any extra money um, that is not needed for the day-to-day -day or monthly um, obligations, it's our recommendation to put it aside into another account that's not accessible through debit cards. Um, also consider, you know, a separate card. If everybody loves to shop on Amazon now and we've gotten used to doing some online purchases for things, um, but it might be a good idea to consider getting another credit card with a small limit just so you can do those purchases. You don't want somebody who ever could potentially um, get a hold of a Visa card or what have you that has a big limit on it because essentially if that gets charged up, we do have great fraud controls that are getting better and better, but why not um, stop the problem and eliminate it if you can. Another thing that we recommend is also consider looking to automate your transactions. Have your bill payments automatically regulated through your bank account and your direct deposits and pensions being um, looked after right into the account. Um, maintain the communication with your advisor as well because essentially um, with everything that's automatic through the account, we can also track things for you a lot easier. It's much better than having checks sent and mailed um, and having to wait you know, because things can get lost that way. Um, the other thing I would say is schedule annual financial reviews and also um, when you do um, activate a power of attorney, which I'll speak to next, um, do make sure that they are introduced to the branch manager and your financial planner or financial advisor at your banking institution. But all of these are things that are protection me measures for everybody right now, act now before it's too late. Um, I mentioned a power of attorney um, and considering this. Now, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions later. Um, there are such things as a power of attorney that you can actually get from your bank. However, those are specifically to be used in um, sort of a pinch or a crunch or for a temporary time. Uh, essentially, we would recommend um, considering something like a legal power of attorney. However, there are banking power of attorneys where you can do financial transactions only, um, but it's usually just to be um, used for a very short term um, for the interim time of looking into uh, getting a legal power of attorney. I'll give an example of this. Some people say, well, why don't I just make the account joint with someone who's looking after me? Well, for example, if you had $100,000, if you had it in a joint account, what that means, though, is that you're actually giving ownership to a secondary person. Um, typically, spouses will do that. But to add on, say, um, a, uh, another person, maybe a child, um, a nephew, a friend, you really have to make sure that you're um, considering who they are. And it may not always be the right thing to do because essentially you're changing the ownership and you're giving that person full access to your entire um, account that has your money in it. Um, it is a very simple solution, though, if you do have someone you trust. Um, there, so therefore, there can be advantages and disadvantages for it, um, which we can touch on later in regards to estate planning. However, there could potentially be less protection to financial abuse because you're relinquishing all control if you're sharing that with that secondary person. And um, that person, whether they're a survivor of yours or whether they're um, still, if you're still alive, they still have equal access to that bank account. Whereas a power of attorney can be legal or the banking power of attorney for finances only. However, the ownership is still yours. It's only there uh, for them to access in the event that it's needed. So therefore, um, it's less flexible, but you still have full control and there's enhanced due diligence and reporting. And that's what we recommend when you talk to your branch manager or your financial planner at the bank, that you establish exactly what your needs are and what exactly your power of attorney is supposed to do um, for you. Um, at the end of it, uh, power of attorney is left to the estate. Um, the next slide is also 
um, in regards to recognizing financial abuse. These can take forms in all kinds of areas, small or large. Um, essentially, if you know there is. I'm not saying that you have a joint account or anything like that. This is more um, an event of if with considering potentially the person you trust. That's why it's important to know what financial abuse could look like. So you are you really give it some thought as to who you'd want to have access your money is really in regards to looking at who can withdraw the money in cash to pay your bills. We also want to look for things about um, what about if you were in a situation that we keep an eye out for any sort of unusual banking activity. This is things that can actually be tracked by your bank. So this is something you can talk to your advisor about. Whereas we can see on a visa card or in a bank account, if there's something that seems out of sorts um, for your loved one, certain things like what if there's unexplained property transfers, um, if there's large cash withdrawals being taken out or large money orders being bought, um, things for, We've seen it just as of late, too, where we saw someone try to take out some money to um, buy a new vehicle, and there was no chance in that car being purchased for that person whatsoever. So these are things that um, we have to uh, always keep an eye out for, and that if you speak with your advisors at the bank, we can help you with that. And the next slide. Um, the other thing we have to look at, too, this is more from... Um, an online standpoint. We call it being cyber aware. Um, also note that there's little tips here that you can jot down about verify to clarify. Um, we have to make sure that you're um, keeping an eye out. Your bank is not going to um, be emailing you. When you're in doubt, toss it out. Obviously, um, if there seems to be some sort of odd email that comes your way, just disregard it. Um, one thing we've seen as of late, too, is someone posing as a person that cleans computers, you know, sending an email saying that they can keep your computer clean and up to date. Just be careful of that. That's, we code that as stranger danger. Um, make sure all your emails are completely read critically, unsubscribing to junk email that you don't need, and please don't click on any unnecessary links. Okay, and um, as far as um, any banking institution, RBC will never, ever ask for any of your personal information, verification, email, social insurance number, anything like that. So uh, make sure if you feel any questions that way and you're stuck at home and can't make it into the bank, call the number on the back of your credit card or on the back of your debit card um, for any verifications or inquiries. Lastly, I'd say um, internet shopping, I would say just look at your familiar websites. You could consider putting double verification on certain websites, like for example, like um, uh, Amazon purchases now, you can, you know, to avoid being, um, having any problems there, you can put two verifications on there. You can sign in and then they can send a text to your, to your, to your cell phone for, for added protection. Um, we also recommend that you make purchases with a credit card. Uh, your credit card hopefully should give you a one-year guarantee as well. If there's any problems um, with things that are sent an error to your house or returned, um, you have that as well as protection that if it was not your spend, you, you're definitely reversed or rebated for any of that money that could have been charged in error. So we highly recommend using a credit card with a small limit to make your online purchases. And please don't save your credit card numbers or anything. Don't write it down. Please keep it aside. Great. Thank you, now, um, well, yeah. thanks. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll um, thank you, Lauren. That was a lot of information in, in a quick time, and we are trying to compact a lot here. So leaving enough time for questions and answers at the end. So I appreciate you running through all of those details. I'm going to shift focus a little bit now more into the financial planning side and um, planning for specific events. So this could be a change in, um, in your living situation. This could be a change in your health. This could be planning for a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's. 
So I thought I'd start with just some, some fun facts here. So these are all truths of all the age groups in Canada. The fastest growing demographic right now is Canadians over the age of 100. The monthly costs of assisted living, living facilities in Canada range from approximately 1500 on the very low end to 5000 a month. However, if an individual has dementia or Alzheimer's, that cost can jump to between 3000 and 7000 per month. By 2038, so in 16 years, it's expected that 1.1 million Canadians will be living with some form of dementia. And in Ontario, wait lists for certain public care facilities are expected to double in the next six years. So not all good truths to be looking at. And unfortunately, a big fiction is that a lot of Canadians do not or the fiction is that the Canadians have put appropriate plans in place. And in reality, a lot of families have not talked about um, these, these issues in details, and they might be looking at a right now picture versus a later and down the road picture. And that's really when um, financial planning comes into the picture, into, into helping families. So financial planning really is a process and it's something that is often a service that is part of um, the, the institution that you work with. So at the bank, there are financial planners that will specifically sit down and work with clients more on what I'm talking about today. I do this with clients, with our investment clients. And there's also financial planners that are independent from any of the banks that you can hire just to sit down and work through a plan or a specific situation with you. The process of financial, financial planning really starts with getting a comprehensive understanding of your current financial situation. So looking at four main categories. So what your assets are, so this would be your house, your savings accounts, investments. It then takes a look at what your liabilities are. So these would be things like mortgages, um, credit cards, or other debt that you might have outstanding. It'll also look at what your incomes, your form of income. So pensions are usually the largest form of income, whether that's government or private. And then sometimes people earn income from other sources like a rental property or investments. And then finally, the biggest piece, which is the expenses. And, and that could be your home expenses, your, um, your car, cell phone, to all the way through to assisted living or helping family members. So when you're looking at what a financial plan is, it's really taking a, a picture in time of the current of what all of those buckets are for you and your family and understanding how that could change over time. And so once you have gone through the process of getting all of that information into one spot and working with a planner to do that for you, they can show you projections of what might happen in different situations. And this is really when the planning process starts, is considering those potential what-if scenarios. So um, in talking today, that could be talking about, uh, well, what if I've been diagnosed with dementia and what could the possible scenarios be down the road with the progression of that, um, that disease? Where would, uh, what would maybe happen with my living situation? And then when you know what some of the what if scenarios are, you can then really look at the details on how are you, how will you be able to afford different scenarios if that comes up and what are your resources to do that? And financial planning gets it in, into the weeds. And we often like to then start look at how can we help you save taxes and then also make sure that your money is going to you first, of course, but then efficiently going to your family members. So once you've gone through that process, um, I think uh, I'll just back up. I think the, the first step then, if you've not done a financial plan, would be to reach out to who you would consider your advisor right now. So again, this might be a relationship that you have in your local bank, um, or it might be a relationship with you have with somebody um, like myself who would be on on an investment side. It could be with somebody who you have insurance policies with. They will often do financial planning. 
if you don't have any of any of those people in your life and you feel like this is a process that might be um, really beneficial, then I would start to do some research on who are some independent financial planners that you could hire to do this as a one time situ situational event. Um, once the financial plan is done, it's usually comprehensive. It will often go through different graphs and show you the different what if scenarios over time and will result in recommendations for you and also an action plan. So, you know, my big takeaway would be once you've gone through that process um, or even when you're when you're in the process, involve your caregiver or family members or close friend who is going to be um, navigating your journey with you in this process. So whether they are doing the plan with you, with your professional, or whether you're sharing that plan afterwards and going through the scenarios with them. And the reason why that's so important is because ultimately what this plan is going to help you do is identify what your wishes and intentions are right now, um, what some of those might be down the road, and communicate that really well to the people that are closest with you so that as things change in your situation these intentions and wishes are on paper and they've been communicated and everybody can be working with you to make sure that things happen just as you would like to see fit and then you know lauren talked about this um, earlier and i can't say how important it is to start these conversations early um, I start financial planning with my clients when they are, you know, in their 30s and they're just, you know, doing all of the exciting things, buying a house and, and having kids. And then we update that plan as different situations come up because they will for every family. Wonderful situations will come up and scary situations will come up that people will have to deal with. When you start the conversations early and you have this foundation of a plan, it's something that you and your family can go back to and, um, and use to navigate whatever comes across your path. When we're doing planning and especially in a situation where there has been a change in, um, in health and um, you're talking with people about when staying at home is no longer an option. This is just a really quick slide on this and it's something easy that I use and it's it's the, called the three C's. So it's really looking at your options in terms of care, cost and choice. So if you look under care, um, you know, what is the type of care that you require? And I, and I would always recommend looking at this now and then also be looking at it, what could be down the road. So what is the care that's required now? Um, what is based on medical condition? And then what could change with that? And what might be the care that's required down the road? What is the cost now? And then what could be additional costs that may be incurred? When you're looking at the cost side, um, just as a financial planning tip, I would always break out the actual cost of your care and your medical um, expenses versus your regular living costs, which would be accommodation and food. And I think, you know, as people's situations change, when these things are broken out, it's a lot easier to plan um, and make adjustments based on, um, you know, maybe it's a care cost that's changing or a, an accommodation. So keeping them separate is a good idea. And then, of course, the choice, which is really the personal um, personal preferences on what type of care you ideally would like. If it is um, in a assisted living facility or in some type of um, full care facility, what are the other options that are important to you? I've listed some of them here, pets, religious, cultural amenities. What is the preferred location? Um, where is your family in relation? And then, of course, you know, when you have your preferences, that's when you start to back into what are the options from a financial perspective. So um, lastly, I'm just going to talk a little bit about a resource that we're going to share with you today, and it's called the Wellness Binder. And um, this was RBC on uh, at Wealth Management actually just uh, started an engagement 
with a company called Elder Care. And this is a company that is now going to be providing one-on-one -on -one consultations with our clients um, when they have uh, aging, when they are aging, when they've had a change in health circumstance. And um, the, the owner of Elder Care actually created this wellness binder when she was dealing with her own journey with um, her mom's Alzheimer's diagnosis. And she was finding that she needed all of this information. So she was accumulating it in one spot. And through that process, she developed this wellness binder that she has shared with us as advisors. And, and we're going to share it with you today. And really what this is, it's, it's very large. <laughs> it seems daunting because there's a lot of components, but you know, I would say you can look at it all in entirety and more important you can look at different pieces of it so you know right now might be important to look at the medical piece um, you might not be worried about looking at home changes in a home care situation so you might leave that piece for now but when that situation comes up with you where you might have to start examining different options with home care or um, or facilities you know you can maybe go to that section of the binder and pull it out Really what it's looking at is all of your personal information, your medical information, who your advisors are. And I'm going to, to attempt to um, share my screen here and pull that up for you. So just give me one moment. I'm not as apt at technology as I am on financial planning. So mm -hmm. going to... I've got it here and I'm hoping that this will pull this up. Okay, I'm gonna try stopping sharing the presentation and try this one more time. I would really like to show you. Susan, I'm sorry, I can see the wellness <laughs> binder. There it is. Okay, this will work. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see this. So, um, so this is the title page and this is all of the different sections in this binder. So as, as I mentioned, there's your medical information. It gets quite detailed. So starting with personal um, summary and when you click on any of these sections, if you're looking at this electronically, you can just click and it will take you right to the section. And this is where um, you might list what the condition is, what the date of diagnosis is, and who the doctor is of that specific, um, specific condition. I'm just going to go back to that main list. And it will go through from medical to um, information around who your so the medical is quite extensive. It talks about all your physicians, your pharmacies, and this is where I'm saying maybe not all of this is relevant, um, but this is pretty much everything that she ever needed to know for her mom and that anybody needed to know for her. So you might want to pull a piece out and just look at that. Um, if we're looking at the POA, that gets into talking about um, your wills, where they are, who your power of attorneys are, what any advanced care directives are, could all be listed in here. And then of course, listing all of the financial information, where your investments are, where you bank, any online accounts, digital passwords. There's some articles in here um, for caregivers and also for, um, for individuals. And I'm just going to scroll down to the bottom, which is um, an, a section that's on residential options. And this is interesting because she's included even in this a retirement residence comparison chart. So when you're starting to look at what some of the options might be, you can use this to write in your notes um, on about each of the places that you've visited. It talks about the size of the room, the cost. And then another, in, um, I was listening to her actually speak, and another 
um, interesting point that she had is make sure you take pictures when you go to visit the different places so that you can easily um, go back and, and re remember, oh yes, this was choice one, choice two, choice three. So it's a very comprehensive um, document. And um, like I said, I think it can be used all together or in, in pieces. And now I'm just going to get back into the presentation really easily. Okay. And with that, that is, um, you know, kind of very briefly about financial planning uh, to end off. I would just like to say that, you know, uh, never ever be afraid to use the resources that are available. So whether that's asking a lawyer, asking your banker, um, your investments, anybody who you really rely on, accountant is a great resource. And, um, and if it sounds like that financial planning process might be something that, that might be helpful for you to start, start with the person you're most familiar with and ask them who they would use. Um, and that, that's a good starting place. So I am going to hand it over to Susan McDonald now, who is going to talk about the last section of the presentation, which is on power of attorneys and estate planning. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Jessica and um, Susan. So pleased to be here and asked to join in on this panel discussion. Today, I am going to discuss power of attorneys, do a little bit of estate planning because that's always a big topic as uh, who to name as executor. And the reason that I can talk to this is I'm with RBC Royal Trust. A trust company in Canada is the only corporate body that can act as an executor, trustee, power of attorney. So for example, in your will, you can name an individual or a trust company. And the reason that people like trust companies is because we continue on. Like Lauren and Jessica, we are audited, second set of eyes over every transaction that we do, plus timelines, service standards, and in-house, we have legal, tax, and also the, the important investment expertise that Jessica can provide. Uh, so sort of a one-stop shop on doing estates and trusts. And, and fortunately, none of us as individuals get good at selling estates or acting as attorney because you might just be called upon once or twice in your life, lifetime and you're considered to be an ex expert <laughs> immediately in managing it. So uh, certainly we provide some relief to many families, their needs uh, as far as being able to provide this level of expertise and knowledge. We'll flip the screen. So where do you begin? I have many discussions on estate planning and you wonder, where do I start? Am I trying to save probate fees? Am I looking at my beneficiary designations? Am I looking at the most tax efficient? And I think some of the best advice I've ever received is just start with what you want to do. So I want to leave everything to my spouse. And if by chance my spouse is predeceased, I want it to go here. It's just all worst case scenario. So think first, what do you want to do so it doesn't get overwhelming and prevents you from giving instructions to your lawyer? Is if you come up with that basic, then let your advisors help you with the best way to achieve your goal. I think another good um, point is, and I heard this recently and I can't believe it's taken this long for me to even think of it, is to do a bit of a fire drill on your estate plan. And the reason for that is I come in most often after the individual has died and I'm visiting with the children about their inheritance in the estate or beneficiaries. And they'll say, that's not what mom and dad said they wanted. They wanted it to flow this way. So they didn't really understand what's in the will. And who's to blame an individual drafting a will or giving instructions because it's not a common document. It, it really is very wordy. So I really love this idea that you would have a look, make sure I've got my will, I've got my power of attorney, I've read through it, I understand exactly what's gonna happen on my passing, I understand where my RSP or my cottage and so on and so forth registration affects it so that you can ensure that what you want is what's followed through on, on your passing. Some of the other considerations 
questions before you go to draft is family situation. Do you have um, an individual that's receiving ODSP, Ontario uh, Disability Support Payments, which are income geared? There's ways to structure it. So look at what your beneficiary needs are. Uh, also, the type of assets that you have, how were they registered? Or do they actually flow through your will or do they go outside of it? And choice of executor, and I'll cover some of the qualities that you want to look for in an executor and power of attorney. Together with your legal obligations. So you may, you may have obligations to dependents. If someone's living in your home and you're paying um, for all of their expenses, then you need to make sure that you provide for them in the will or your estate can expect a claim. So you, you have to consider what are my spousal obligations, dependents, is there a divorce contract that needs to pay out? So consider that when you're putting together your plan. And then on top, tax and probate, which you can, really can't avoid. <laughs> we'll flip. So what is an executor? Common misconception. If you're executor, you've got an executor, that they're going to take care of you if you're alive but incompetent. The will only takes effect on death. It is a very private document. It's not referred to. No one can bring the will in and say, I'm named as executor prior to the individual's death, so we need the death certificate. So that just occurs on death. When you're alive, then it's a power of attorney if by chance you become incapacitated, that takes care. So you need both documents. It's not just one or the other. Uh, there's certain implications if you haven't done a will that's different from the power of attorney. The only time I've seen these kind of cross paths is um, if an individual is incapacitated and for example, the personal care power of attorney has said, and also medical professionals can't stay at home any longer. We need to go to a retirement nursing home, whatever uh, stronger bit of care that's required. And you're thinking, well, do I keep the house? Um, or what do I do with all the personal articles? We just need to fill a room. You know, do you put it in storage and have these additional costs? Well, the funds aren't required by the donor the individual that's incapacitated, then you could very well look at the will and it says, my grand piano is to go to my niece, Debbie, and deliver it in advance as opposed to pay those storage costs. So that's kind of the one time you sort of look to the will as to what maybe the last time they had capacity, what their wishes were for personal articles. And we'll flip to the next. So what is a power of attorney? We know about um, executor very clearly. That's in the will. That's the person that fills, does all the estate administration, is responsible for all of the will instructions. Power of attorney is an individual signs the document while capable, and they name an individual to manage their finances if they become incapacitated. It can be... Um, just on incapacity, or it can be continuing or enduring, which covers when you have capacity to the point you're incapacitated. So they could immediately act. And there are some provisions within the attorney to make sure there's a triggering event so that someone's not walking around with the attorney and saying, look, I'm managing it, please let me put a mortgage on their homes uh, type abuse. So there, there are some safeguards for that, but it's an incredibly powerful document. And we'll flip. So two types of power of attorneys. One is for personal care. The age for that is age 16, as far as someone can act as personal care attorney, which is um, unique. Usually you have age 18 that you have legal capacity to do that. And this is the person that makes all of your medical direction. And they also make where are you going to live decisions. We'll never act as financial, but if we 
I'm sorry, as personal care, but if we are called upon on property financial, we'll work very closely with the personal care as to budgeting for whatever the lifestyle is going to be for the donor. Two types of power of attorneys for property. One could be very specific. So I just want you to deal with my bank account or my house. And then there's a full on one, which is enduring and continuing. And it means that they can help you, that attorney can start to act when you're competent or incompetent. What I really appreciate about this type of attorney is if you're struggling um, with capacity and you could have 100% um, capacity, but you might just not have the energy at age 100 to kind of consolidate your investments and to make sure all your bills are being paid or sell your house or move at that point, redirect mail. So you may um, have that attorney step in before incapacity, or you may never become incapacitated, but at least they could help you along the way if you want to focus on other activities. Then we'll go to the next. So what does an attorney have to do? Um, they have to act in your best interests. They even have to consult with you um, if you're incompetent and try to gain your approval. So there's a, a high level of process only in your best interests. So even though it may have been your wish to gift $100,000 to one child over another, you spoke about it before the power of attorney was invoked, that may not be in your best interest anymore. There may be a need for that income to pay for your retirement home nursing care. The There is attorney compensation. It is... Um, it can be set out in the document. You could even put in the power of attorney document that you're not entitled to any compensation and, and that's fine. If failing that, you can also, um, you know, come up with a standard rate and pass your accounts as attorney. And I will be sending um, a checklist out for attorneys and also executors so that you've got a good idea as to what all those tasks are I, I think at one time we used to all feel that that was an honor to be named as an executor or as an attorney. And now it's, gosh, why did you do that to me? I, you know, trying to manage my own life and my own personal concerns. And, and sometimes you're having to battle with beneficiaries of an estate or conflicting interests um, of other uh, family members. So it can be really difficult. It's also right on top of uh, the, um, you're, you're living your life and then you're trying to add someone else's life responsibilities onto yours. And it can be very demanding. And as mentioned before, lack of expertise. As individuals, we're not good at settling estates or acting as attorney. So you really have to stay up and form on estate and trust law, taxation, um, acting as an attorney. What if you live far away? Um, certainly as a personal care, not as much of a concern because you can certainly jet in and um, choose the place and then consult with doctors and caregivers, you know, uh, over um, phone or the internet. But it can become a trouble when you need someone on site uh, where they're going to be for property and you're trying to deal with the real estate and contractors. It could also be a conflict of interest because of, if, for example, you're a beneficiary of the estate. And so can you continue to make sure that bills are being paid and you're not depleting capital? And where is the benefit on that? And you also have liability. Uh, anyone can, you know, question what you've done as an executor power of attorney, and you'd be responsible for not following the instructions or not acting in the best interest of the individual. So to split. So who should you choose? Uh, just make sure that they're um, they're trustworthy, they're honest, um, that they have the time they actually have a discussion and ask, are you willing to act as my attorney? Is this something that would interest you? 
no one has to accept an executor or attorney appointment. You can't compel someone to, to act. You can only name them. That they're located close to you, they understand the duties, and if they don't, that they're willing to seek good advice, and then they're not in a perceived or conflict of interest at all. Great. So this, this is the uh, general information on it. Uh, we are sending out a health check on um, your estate planning to make sure you've covered all subject. Then when you're doing your um, will and power of attorney, together with the power of attorney checklist will come out to you. And also um, the executive checklist. Thank you, Susan. So I think with that, Susan, we can get into any of the questions that have come up. Uh, you're on mute. Though. Yes, we can. We Great. Thank you. I'm trying to get everyone spotlighted here. So we will do Great. some questions. And thank you for those who have added questions in the uh, Q&A box. And again, if you have any additional questions, please get those in the Q&A or upvote ones that you already see. So uh, we'll start with um, why do we hear sometimes that banks won't accept a legal POA and require their own? Maybe, Lauren, that would be best directed to you. Sure, I can take that question. I hope you can all hear me. Um, literally, I would say that is because um, there's some nerves probably from that person, the banking representative about being able to verify a legal power of attorney. So in a sense, um, I still encourage you to bring the original of a legal power of attorney if you have it, uh, because they just we basically just need to verify that and as well if they have the actual endorsement or the um, notarized copy that is stamped by the lawyer or the solicitor um, that does override everything so yeah. typically people will say well we need to use our own document because they're used to seeing it but the legal power of attorney is probably better yeah so that's what lauren and i were talking about this before the presentation so if you are going into a bank and they are saying no we need this form too that might be a time where you might want to talk with the bank manager to verify because mm -hmm. it could be just a matter that you're dealing with somebody that might not have the um, experience with with that the legal power of attorney should suffice in most situations if you're getting some feedback that they need their own as well then that would be a good time to, to uh, maybe speak with the manager great thank you uh, next question. Um, is it accurate that if a caregiver has a joint account with a person living with dementia who is overspending, that the caregiver could end up liable for debts and overdraw overdrawals? Uh, that would be a risk to a caregiver in signing up for a joint account. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Now, that being said, back to the comparison of the joint account versus the power of attorney is that there's equal control on that there. So in a sense, you would be responsible. However, you would have the power to go in and close that account yourself um, should there be problems where you're getting into an overdraft as such. Great, thank you very Remember, much. Remember, we always have to act in, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, guys, I, I, I just thought of something. We always have to act in the best interest of the person you're looking after. So in order to stop that, you would probably need to request that account be closed. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question, um, I think this one might not be within your realm. Um, so the, the person saying that they have a, a, a sibling who is a personal care for, um, POA for personal care, uh, and this individual is a POA for property. Uh, the sibling is uh, anti-vaccine and denies the, the parent the vaccine. Is it possible to have the father to go to a long-term care facility or not in this scenario? That is a little bit outside yeah. of our realm because I think it's really talking about the what the long-term care facility requirements are. Um, but I, I do think in most of them that the vaccine is is mandated but that would yeah you need to speak with i think the um facility in that scenario first okay susan any thoughts on this i know i think you mentioned about poa for health talked about where the person lives as well 
Uh, any any comments on this? I I I think that if ideally it's someone that lives uh, near you and can be looking at different retirement nursing homes, uh, or if you're remaining in the home, that they can actually be on site to make sure that the care is sufficient for you. That's ideal, but um, more often than not, we're having those power of attorney personal cares, they're living out of country, <laughs> we're sort of spreading out more, and that shouldn't stop them from being able to come up and visit and set things up. Okay, thank you. And, and, calls. And, mm -hmm. and certainly for the person asking the question, I would certainly encourage you to reach out to your social worker and maybe um, get some support from them around this question, and they might be able to help further direct you with this. Um, so I have uh, just a couple of other questions. So uh, question about what is uh, the normal or standard rate for doing POA for property? I know Susan, you, you referenced this. Um, is the person has not been giving themselves anything but it does take several hours a week and managing and overseeing investments and accounts. Hmm. So if the attorney document allows it, uh, the court rates are, and it's always subject to a court passing if, um, if at the very end on death, uh, beneficiaries look at what you charged, it could be that you have to present your accounts. But in general, it's two and a half at the start, two and a half at the end. Uh, point percent, two and a half percent. Yes, at the start, two and a half percent at the end. And it's called a distribution fee. And then two and a half on percent on capital additions such as capital gains in the investments, two and a half on capital disbursements, which would be paying tax on that capital gains, and 6% uh, of revenue, you would just look at the annual tax return and multiply that by 6%. And those are the fees that you can charge so much as a portion to capital and revenue, but any fees you charge as an executor or attorney are subject to the eventual beneficiary's approval, and they can force you to go to court, which would be a, you know, a really challenging account passing where you've got to put all this information in a lovely package, hire lawyers, and um, have a court time and have delays in receiving your inheritance or the attorney being able to act. Thanks, Susan. Is there, um, again, to have that, it's a lot of inf very detailed information. Is that information found somewhere or um, who would be a good person to speak to you to kind of get that information again? I, I think if you're acting as attorney, you should visit with the lawyer that's representing and ask about compensation. Check the attorney to see whether or not you can charge it and, um, and then have them help you with the calculation. I'm, I'm sure you can Google it under public guardian and trustee attorney fees in Ontario as well. Great. I'll Thank see you. if I can get a site, but it, it's not just a done deal that you've calculated this. It's just the standard rate. Great. Thank you. I think we'll we'll try if, if the panelists are okay to answer uh, maybe one more question. Yeah, of course. Thank you. So uh, what should... There's a couple of quick ones here. I'm reading the... I'm oh, reading great. ahead. There are a couple of quick ones that we could, could kind of... Um, really quickly go through. Sure, the, Jessica, the, which one do you see? Uh, that yeah, I see that, can your POA, so can your power of mm -hmm. attorney and your executor be the same individual? And the answer to that is yes, they can be the same individual or they can be different individuals. Or as Susan said, you can appoint a corporate um, power of attorney for finance and you can appoint a corporate executor. The only one you can't appoint corporate for is for personal care. So you can have them be the same individual. Normally when you are um, going through the process of creating these documents, the lawyer is going to ask you for a backup though. So um, if you have one individual that might be acting as your power of attorney for property and personal care and your executor, and this is very common with a spouse. So normally you'll see the spouse and you'll act as each other for all three. Um, and your lawyer is going to ask you, well, who is going to be your backup if the spouse is not able to do that or doesn't want to do that based on circumstances that they're going through at that time? Great, thank you. And I see a question here um, 
again, what should the care partner do when concerned that the person living with dementia has lost insight and is withdrawing too much money? Lauren, do you want to uh, take that? Again, one? yeah. yeah well, it, it, if it gets really out of control, you can go and close that account um, if you had to. Um, it, the other thing you can do is make sure uh, that you speak as well to the bank representative that keeps an eye touch to the branch manager who in turn can flag it and they can put specific notes on the bank account as well. Um, I have seen it done in the past too, where a password needs to be done in order to access certain things as well. So there are little intricacies that you can prearrange, hence I, a good reason to um, meet with the people in the local branch where you are, where the, um, where the bank account is located or where you're located. And that's some of some of the things in terms of, you know, maybe moving money into a savings account. So the person who is helping manage maybe having that savings account that is separate, that has the person still has the autonomy to use one account, but maybe not all, um, you know, looking at the limits for your debit cards and credit cards. And again, maybe using a different credit card for certain functions. So the first step that I think either any of us would recommend is, um, if you don't have a, a contact in your bank and you're dealing with this type of situation, please make an appointment. And if you don't know who to make that appointment with, ask for the bank manager. It's not a problem. They are there to help you or they will direct you to the right person. So use those resources that are available um, and to sit down and talk about the situation that you're dealing with to put together a plan that's going to work best for your family. Great. Thank you. And that might hopefully we'll address a couple of the other questions I think that kind of are connected about, again, if the person living with dementia doesn't refuses to close an account, um, anything Same thing. that, yeah. And the manager is going to be anything with closing an account, the manager is going to be likely involved at some point. So, you know, if you have a contact that you have a good relationship with, they're a good first person. Um, and the, the, the manager would be the next person. The next best person yeah and i'd just like to add something it's it's surprising but there is no oversight of attorneys it's not unless someone makes a complaint and sees i think sally's driving a new car or taking lots of trips maybe we should look at what she's doing for her great aunt uh, then there's an investigation and they look at the accounts, but there is no nobody saying, have you done this? Have you done that? It, it's on their own schedule. Okay, thank you. Anything else here, Jessica, that you wanna? Yeah, I see one more from, Mar from on the end here that talks about online purchases and that mm -hmm. slide. And I think when we had that slide up and it says not to write down your credit card, I think the main, um, the main point on that was not to save your credit card in any vendor website. So if you're on Amazon, don't save your credit card in that website. And then of course, if you write that down and keep it in a very safe place in your home, then, then that is, you know, you're the one in your home. That would be highly unlikely that that would be accessed. So if you need to do that, but what we'll recommend is have your wallet there with you when you're going to make a purchase, pull your credit card out at that time, type in the digits, and then put the credit card back back in your wallet or where you might be keeping it. But the most important thing I think from that one slide was don't save the actual numbers in, um, in an Amazon website where your computer is remembering it for you. That's a great point. Th great clarification, Jessica. Thank you for that. And there's just one uh, question about, again, if you have a bank account abroad, do you need a POA for that bank as well as your local bank? Any, any differentiation there? Yeah. Susan, do you know the answer to this one? I would assume that every bank is going to need to see your POA. I don't know if you would need a separate one, but it's really, I think, going to come down to the bank, the bank abroad and their mandates. Uh, so absolutely. Absolutely. The the only issue, and Lauren had alluded to it, is that there sometimes there's a specific power of attorney with um, financial institutions, where my um, bank account in the UK, this is another person like my cousin in the UK can access it for to pay my bills on my home there. 
uh, and that's just very specific. It's not your whole power of attorney. So sometimes they misunderstand and think, well, I can do every, anything everywhere <laughs> with you. Just really quickly on one more question here, because we can do this one quick. It, it asks, do you need the actual power of attorney or will a copy suffice? When you are setting up that arrangement with any financial institution, they are going to want to see the original power of attorney, which has um, been, um, the, it's escaping me, notarized. Uh, so the original is needed in any time you are setting up that situation. If it's more of a care, something else. So if it's financial related and it's the first time you're setting it up, then yes, an original power of attorney should be uh, required. It definitely is with RBC across our platforms. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to do a, a quick wrap up and I wanted to uh, thank uh, RBC Wealth Management Dominion Securities for generously sponsoring this event and Laura and Jessica and Susan, thank you so much for taking the time out of your, I know your very busy schedules to share your knowledge and expertise with us. And we know your presentation will stimulate further conversation. And to our attendees who are still on with us, uh, thank you so much for attending this month's Brain Matters webinar. And we do hope that you, uh, to see you next month. Uh, next month, we are, um, we will be welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Finger, uh, a neurologist at the Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer Research Center at Parkwood Institute, and Susan Conacher, a genetic counselor at LHSC with the Medical Genetics Program of Southwestern Ontario, and that registration will be open very soon. And lastly, uh, please complete a short evaluation when you leave the webinar today. It should pop up when you leave um, to click the leave leave button to do that. Uh, or you can scan the QR code um, using the camera on your phone to access the evaluation. And we thank you for attending and please enjoy the rest of your day.